Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This is Jeff Murren. Let's uh, finish up our conversation of Hamlet. In this particular video, we are going to look at Act 5 in its entirety. There are only two scenes. The second scene is quite lengthy because a lot happens. This is when, quite frankly, all hell breaks loose. Um, and uh, what I want to do is begin with, of course, scene one, then move to scene two. And I'm going to read on page 238 of the Folger edition the synopsis at the top of the page. It says, Hamlet returned from his journey, comes upon a grave digger singing as he digs. Hamlet tries to find out who the grave digger, who the grave is for and reflects on the skulls that are being dug up. A funeral procession approaches. Hamlet soon realizes that the corpse is Ophelia's. When Laertes in his grief leaps into her grave and curses Hamlet as the cause of Ophelia's death, Hamlet comes forward. He and Laertes struggle with Hamlet protesting his own love and grief for Ophelia. So we begin reading on page 239. We have two grave diggers who are working and having a conversation as they are doing so. They are talking about what turns out to be Ophelia. They're digging her grave and about whether or not she intended that did she drown herself or was this all an accident? And if it, were, if it were not an accident and she did drown herself, then why is she being allowed to have a Christian burial? The gravedigger on line 15 begins reading, Give me leave. You know, Here lies the water. Good. Here stands the man. Good. If the man go to this water and drown himself, it is, will he nilly, he goes, mark you that. But if the water come to him and drown him, he drowns not himself. Argal, he that is not guilty of his own death, shortens not his own life. He's not responsible for it, okay, is what he's saying. If, he, if the water comes to him rather than he goes to the water, then he's not responsible. And if that's the case, then all right, this grave all makes sense. Continuing on in this conversation with the two grave diggers, one gravedigger poses a question as if it is a riddle. And I think it's interesting. It's sort of posed as a joke, but I think there is something pretty um, significant, something rather poignant in it. And the, what he's getting at here is the permanence of death. Something that Hamlet worried about, you know, uh, to sleep, perchance to dream. I don't know what lies on the other side. But one thing Hamlet was certain of is death is permanent. One cannot come back from it, all right? So the grave digger says on line 42, What is he that builds stronger than either the mason, the shipwright, or the carpenter? And the other says, The gallows maker, for that frame outlives a thousand tenants, all right? So who builds the strongest, most everlasting thing? Maybe the person who builds the gallows because it's used for person after person after person, hanging after hanging after hanging, Okay. Gregory says, I like thy wit well in good faith. The gallows does well, but how does it well? It does well to those that do ill. Okay, it works really well for those who do badly. All right. Now, thou dost ill to say the gallows is built stronger than the church, Argal. The gallows may do well to thee. To it again. Come. The other says, who builds stronger than a mason, a shipwright, or a carpenter? Aye, tell me that, and unyoke. Mary. Now, I, I can tell. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I cannot tell. All right, the grave digger says, cudgel thy brains no more about it, for your dull ass will not mend his pace with beating. And when you are asked this question next, say, a grave maker. The houses he makes last till doomsday. Hamlet and Horatio then walking, they come upon these grave diggers and uh, they find it very interesting that, you know, they're doing this horrible job, but they're singing as they do it. Like, do they not understand what it is that they're involved in? Of course, this job though has become rather commonplace for them. So it's just a job. But to Hamlet, you know, one who thinks very deeply and is very emotional about things, he's going to see it in a much different light, all right? 
Um, the grave digger, though, while singing, digs up a skull. And Hamlet says on line, let's say 75, 76, 78 or so, on page two, uh, 243, says, That skull had a tongue in it and could sing once. How the knave jowls it to the ground as if twere Cain's jawbone. Here we are again, Cain, Abel, okay? As if it were Cain's jawbone that did the first murder. This might be the pate of a politician, which this ass now or reaches, one that would circumvent God, might it not? Like, these could be any people of really significant uh, impact on humanity. He goes on, or a courtier which could say, good morrow, sweet Lord. How dost thou, sweet Lord? This might be my Lord such a one that praised my Lord such a one's horse when, when he went to beg it, might it not? Like this could be anybody. But those lives actually had purpose at one time. They actually touched other lives. But now they are just skulls being dug up haphazardly while someone sings. So on page 247, Hamlet begins to speak to the gravedigger and ask him some questions, all right? He asks him on line 130, let's say 132, he says, What man dost thou dig for? The gravedigger says, For no man, sir. What woman then? For none either. Who is to be buried in it? One that was a woman, sir, but rest her soul. She's dead. And Hamlet continues on asking questions. Line 145. How long hast thou been a grave, grave maker? Grave digger replies, of all the days of the year. Came to it that day after that day that our last King Hamlet overcame Fortinbras. How long is that since? Can you not tell? Every fool can tell that. It was that very day that young Hamlet was born. He that is mad and sent to England. All right, so now it's become common knowledge. Hamlet is learning that it's become common knowledge that he is considered mad by everybody. Okay? Uh, Hamlet says, I, Mary, why was he sent to England? All right, but what, what, let's see what the common people have to say about that. Why? Because he was mad. He shall recover his wits there, or if he does not, tis no great matter there. He says, well, why? Why doesn't it matter if he doesn't, you know, overcome his madness in England? Gravedigger says, "'Twill not be seen in him there. There the men are as mad as he." All right, so is this Shakespeare kind of poking fun at his own people, poking fun at his own government there to say, hey, man, crazy people are a dime a dozen, especially in the royalty in England. So the grave digger continues working, and he digs up a skull, and he holds the skull up and says to Hamlet, you know, this belonged to a specific person. And he names that person, and Hamlet knows that person. So now, what Hamlet was mentioning as impersonal, like this could have been this person, you know, some dignitary or, or whatever, he now sees the skull, and it is someone who he actually has a history with. So the permanence of death and how much death affects the living is going to resonate with him, all right? Of course, he's been dealing with and reeling over the death of his father, so he knows, yes, you know, how much death affects the living. But here it is on this other level, which even seems, you know, someone not as significant as one's own, uh, you know, family member, one's own father, but, all right, someone still nonetheless important. On line 186 on page 249, the grave digger says, This same skull, sir, was Sir Yorick's skull, the king's jester. Hamlet says, This? He and that. Hamlet takes the skull and says, Let me see. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him well, Horatio. A fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back a thousand times, and now how abhorred in my imagination it is. My gorge rises uh, at it. Here hung those lips that I have kissed. I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now, your gambles, your songs, your, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the whole table on a roar? As they continue speaking about death, the permanence of death, and maybe, you know, the idea of how fleeting this life is, coincidentally enough, 
a funeral procession comes in, comes along, I should say, and it discovers that it is Ophelia's funeral procession. The doctor even mentions, if you want to see on line 234 on page 253, that her death was doubtful. That means her death was suspicious. And they're all discussing how could this have happened to Ophelia. And Laertes is so upset that you will see at the very bottom of the page, he leaps, he throws himself, he leaps into Ophelia's grave and just begs that they just go ahead and throw the dirt on them both. Bury me with her. He's lost his father. He's lost his sister. And he blames Hamlet for both of them. All right? It's interesting that that should happen. Elvis Presley did the same thing. He threw himself on his mother's coffin whenever she was lying in it at uh, her funeral. All right? But he says that on page uh, 255 at the very top. Now pile your dust upon the quick and the dead, upon the living and the dead, upon me living and my sister the dead, till of this flat a mountain you have made toward top old pillion or the skyish head of blue Olympus. Hamlet then steps forward and says, you know, here I am. All right. And Laertes says on line 272, the devil take thy soul. That's how upset he is. He wants actually, you know, essentially go to hell, Hamlet. All right. Hamlet, though, professes his love, his true love, even though he told Ophelia that he did not love her in that one famous uh, scene where the to be or not to be speech was, he now professes, now that it's too late, to everyone around that truly he did love Ophelia and he will do anything to prove it to them. All right. On line 285, he says, I loved Ophelia. 40,000 brothers could not with all their quantity of love make up my sum. What wilt thou do for her? You know, Laertes is saying, you know, he's lost everything. He's wailing. He's upset, throwing himself in the grave. But Hamlet has the audacity to say 40,000 brothers would not love her more than I did. That's a pretty significant statement. They grapple. They fight with one another. Okay. And, you know, uh, Laertes has his hands around Hamlet's throat even here in this. But Hamlet says, you know, Hamlet does get free. Hamlet leaves. And then the king pulls Laertes aside here at the very end, at the very bottom. The king says on line 313, strengthen your patience. Speaking to Laertes, strengthen your patience in our last night's speech. Remember when we, we uh, devised to take Hamlet out. We'll put the matter to the present push. Good Gertrude, set some watch over your son. This grave shall have a living monument. An hour of quiet thereby shall we see. Till then, in patience, our proceedings be. All right? We will go on. We will go on with our plans. But patience. Not quite yet. Player T is not quite yet. Now, for scene two, I don't want to read the summary here. Because I want this to kind of unfold for you as we go through it. I don't want to give you any spoilers here as to how all this plays out. All right? So, let's go ahead and start on page 259, looking directly at the text when Hamlet is explaining to Horatio how he got away from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern on the ship. Remember, they had him going um, to England. Well, how did he get himself free? How did he know what was going on and that he even needed to get himself free in the first place? All right? So, line 15, Hamlet says, Up from my cabin, my sea gown scarfed about me in the dark, I uh, groped I to find out them, had my desire, fingering their packet, and in fine withdrew to mine own room again, making so bold, my fears forgetting manners, to unfold their grand commission, where I found Horatio, a royal knavery, an exact command, larded with many several sorts of reasons, importing Denmark's health and England's too. With, ho, such bugs and goblins in my life that on the supervised no leisure baited, 
No, not to stay the grinding of an axe, my head should be struck off. All right? So what he's saying is, I snuck up. And I took from them the letter that they were to deliver, you know, to England when we got there. And I opened that letter, and what I saw from the king was that whenever I got there, they should not wait for anything, but quickly and immediately execute me, chop my head off. So Hamlet has this idea. I'm going to rewrite the letter. I'm going to rewrite the letter in the king's voice, and I'm going to change the course of what is going to happen whenever these folks get themselves to England. All right? So he says, uh, this is his first uh, time to speak on page 261. He says, being thus benetted round with villainies, or I could make a prolong, prologue to my brains, they had begun the play. I sat me down, devised a new commission, wrote it fair. I once did hold it, as our statists do, a baseness to write fair, and labored much how to forget that learning. But, sir, now it did me yeoman service. Wilt thou know the effect of what I wrote? All right. So basically, you know, I took the time to not sound as though myself, not my learned self, but to sound as the way, you know, this letter did. All right. So do you want to hear? All right. Horatio says, I, good, my lord. Hamlet says, an earnest conjuration from the king, as England was his faithful tributary, as love between them like the palm might flourish, as peace would still her wheaten garland wear, and stand a comma between their amities, and many such like aces of great charge, that on the view and knowing of these contents, without debatement further, more or less, he should those bearers put to sudden death, not shriving time allowed. All right. So he has said now, instead for Hamlet to be put to death, for his childhood friends, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to be put to death. All right. He feels they have double crossed him. So turnabout is fair play, he would say. Horatio, though, asks, how was this sealed? Like, how did you do this? How did you make this look official? And quite a stroke of coincidence, I think. Hamlet says, why, even in that was heaven ordinant, okay? This was like it was heaven sent, okay? I had my father's signet in my purse, you know, the ring that they would put in to stamp the, the wax as the seal, right? Which was the model of that Danish seal, folded the writ up in the form of the other letter, subscribed it, gave, gave it the impression, placed it safely, the changeling never known. They never suspected that I did that, that I changed it out. Okay. Now, the next day was our sea fight, and what to this was sequent, thou knowest already. All right. The next day was when the pirates came or whatever. Now, the question has come up in class. Was that pirate thing planned by Hamlet? Did he suspect something going on? Did he want someone to come and save him and staged it as though it were a pirate ship coming and taking him? Or what really happened there? We're not sure, all right? It doesn't give us those details. Was it an actual pirate ship? That seems unlikely, but I don't know. As Horatio and Hamlet continue to speak about um, all of these circumstances and, and what, what it might mean and, and how things might play out and how things, you know, got to where we are. And, you know, uh, Horatio even asked questions like, you know, what kind of king would do something like this, um, you know, to where he would send you off to murder you or whatever. Um, in walks a, you know, member of the, of the court. His name is Osric, and he has a message to deliver from the king. And he's just this kind of bootlicking, sycophantic um, uh, butt kisser. Uh, watch, watch how Hamlet just messes with him. All right. Uh, let's say line one, uh, oh, two, he comes in as, uh, on page 265. He says, sweet Lord, if your Lordship were at leisure, I should impart a thing to you from his majesty. I have a message from the King. I will receive it, sir. With all diligence of spirit, put your bonnet to its right use. Tis for the head. All right. So he removes it says, thank you, Lordship. It is very hot. Hamlet says, no, believe me. Tis very cold. The wind is northerly. It is indifferent cold, my lord. Indeed. Okay. Whatever you say, whatever you say, that's what it is. 
Hamlet says, but yet methinks it's very sultry and hot for my complexion. Osric, oh, exceedingly, my lord, is very sultry, as t'were I cannot tell how, my lord. His majesty made, uh, bade me signify to you that he has laid a great wager on your head, sir. This is the matter, okay? Like, <laughs> please stop messing with me. I, I, let me. Just let me get my message out, all right? But there's a wager that the king has put on Hamlet, all right? So the wager that the king has placed on Hamlet has to do with that fencing that was mentioned earlier, all right? Um, and Hamlet asks on line um, 157, let's say on page 267, he says, you know, what's his weapon? Osric says, rapier and dagger. That's two of his weapons, but, well, Osric says, the king, sir, hath wagered with him six uh, Barbary horses, against the which he has impawed, as I take it, six French rapiers and uh, poniards, with their uh, assigns as girdle, hangers, and so. Three of the carriages in faith are uh, very dear uh, to fancy, very responsive to the hilts, most delicate carriages, and of most liberal conceits. All right, so these are the things that they've wagered for you and for Laertes to bout as in fencing one another, all right? Osric goes on, on line 178, on page 269, it says, The king, sir, hath laid, sir, that in a dozen passes, a dozen passes between yourself and him, he shall not exceed you three hits. He hath laid on twelve for nine, and it would come to immediate trial of your lordship would vouchsafe the answer. Essentially, he's kind of playing on Hamlet's um, pride here, saying that the king believes that you can beat Laertes. All right? Um, and uh, remember, when Laertes was praised by a Frenchman, that ate Hamlet up. So the king is saying, aha, I'm going to bet on Hamlet, so that's going to puff him up. So he's like, oh, well. Absolutely, I'm going to show myself the better of uh, Laertes, okay? Hamlet on pay, uh, line 186 says, Sir, I'll walk here in the hall, if it please his majesty. It is the breathing time of day with me. Let the foils be brought, let the foils, the, the swords be brought, the gentleman willing, and the king hold his purpose. I'll win for him, and I can. If not, I will gain nothing but my shame and the odd hits. All right? So let's do this. All right, so um, on page 271, a lord enters. All right, the, this person isn't named like Osric was named. All right, don't know if Osric just doesn't have the same uh, title of lord or whatever, so he just has to go by his own name. But anyway, this person summons Hamlet to, uh, you know, face off with Laertes, all right? And it's funny here, um, really, you know, with, with friends like Horatio, I don't know. I mean, is this, uh, if you look, he says on line 221 to 223, he says, you will lose, my lord. Like, thanks for the vote of confidence there, Horatio, all right? And Hamlet says, I do not think so. Since he went to France, I have been in continual practice. I shall win at odds, but thou wouldst not think how ill all's here about my heart. But tis no matter, all right? So what we find is <laughs> when the French person spoke so highly of Laertes and that bothered uh, Hamlet so much, he has been in continual practice, maybe with the hope, I guess, of finally being able to face off with Laertes and show Laertes that he is actually pretty good himself, all right? He's a force to be reckoned with in his own regard or in his own right. All right, so we see uh, on 273, it says, you know, a table prepared, uh, enter, you know, trumpets, drums, officers with uh, cushions, the king, queen, Osric, and all the state, foils, daggers, flagons of wine, and Laertes. Now, you remember the whole thing was like, they were going to fight. Laertes was going to make sure that he chose a specific sword for the bout. That was going to be dipped in uh, a certain oil. Unction was the word they used. 
and that even just the scrape of it would send somebody to his early grave, all right? The backup plan, if you remember, was that one of the cups of wine was going to be poisoned. So if uh, it didn't happen for Laertes to, you know, win this bout and to scrape Hamlet with uh, the, with the not, not foils, because actually this is a real sword, okay? It's not the practice swords, not the foils that um, are typically used in fencing. Um, you know, that he would, you know, Hamlet would get, you know, hot, thirsty with all of the, you know, running around and say, here, you know, have this glass of wine. The wine was going to be poisoned and drop it. That's the plan as it stands. All right. So uh, Hamlet says to Laertes on line 240, give me your pardon, sir. I have done you wrong, but pardoned as you are a gentleman, this presence knows, and you must needs have heard how I am punished with a sore distraction. What have I, what I have done? that might your nature, honor, and exception roughly awake, I here proclaim, was madness. Was Hamlet wrong, was Hamlet wrong, Laertes? Never. Hamlet. If Hamlet, from himself, be taken away, and when he's not himself, does wrong, Laertes, then Hamlet does it not. Hamlet denies it. Who does it then? His madness. If it be so, Hamlet is of the faction that is wrong. His madness is poor Hamlet's enemy. So here we have, you know, the insanity plea. All right? Um, I didn't do this to you, Laertes. I didn't do all of these horrible things. I was crazy. I wasn't myself. I did things that I would never normally do. And because of that, I've wronged you, but not really me. It's my madness that wronged you. I, as Hamlet, in my right mind, would never have done anything to harm you. So, all right, if you look at it, this madness is my enemy because it made me do things I would, normal, not, I would never do, and that caused and brought you pain. So what we have here is like, you know, I plead insanity. All right. They've been thinking Hamlet was crazy all along. Was he crazy on purpose? Crazy like a fox, as they say, which I think that's a wrong way to use that because I always thought it was clever like a fox. But anyway, um, you know, he's has his crazy ideas, his crazy ways been intentional all along? Is this part of his plan? Is there method in his madness? That's the question here. All right. I think it's a valid question. In Laertes' response on the top of page uh, 275, he says, I do receive your offered love like love and will not wrong it. All right. Hamlet says, I embrace it freely and will this brother's wager frankly play? Give us the foils. Come. All right. So, Hamlet believes that he and Laertes are on good terms now, and so this is just going to be a bout amongst friends, you know, a friendly competition or something of the sort, all right? Um, and so uh, Hamlet then says, you know, I'll be your foil, Laertes. In mine ignorance, your skill shall, like a star in the darkest night, uh, stick fiery off indeed. Laertes says, you mock me, sir. No. By this hand, all right? So um, it's almost like Hamlet seems like he's buttering him up. And he's like, you're mocking me, aren't you? All right? It's like, oh, no, 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 no. Just friendly banter. You know, friendly banter. Just, just a little trash talking, all right? So they go to uh, look through the, you know, the different weapons that are out there. Um, and Laertes is making sure that he, he chooses the right one, the one that is an actual sword, one that has been dipped in poison, all right? You know, he even says there, to make it look official, all right, uh, a little more than halfway down the page, he says, this is too heavy. Let me see another. Like, nah, I don't like this one. I don't like this one. Okay, so it looks like he's just choosing, you know, whichever one works, okay? Hamlet says, this likes me well. These foils have all the length. Hi, my good lord. All right, so these are these are the ones that are, we're going to use. These are the ones that are regulation. Yep, they are. All right, so here we go. 
And you notice they, that you know, they prepare to play the stage notes there, and the king says, set me the stoops of wine up on the table. So he's getting ready for that backup plan. All right, so they begin their uh, fencing, their sword play on page 277. Hamlet says, come on, sir. Come, my lord, Laertes' response. And immediately, <laughs> Hamlet, one, one point against you. Laertes says, no. Hamlet calls for a judgment. And Oscar says, a hit, a very palpable hit. Laertes, well, again. All right, the king says, say, give me a drink. Hamlet, this pearl is thine. Here's to thy health. It says he drinks and then drops the pearl in the cup to poison it. All right. And the king says, give him the cup. He's trying to hu hurry this thing, rush this thing along. Hamlet says, I'll play this bout first. Set it by a while. Come. They play. Hamlet immediately. Another hit. What say you? Laertes, a touch, a touch. I do confess. All right. Um, the king says, our son shall win. Says this to the queen, which I think will, you know, make it seem as though he's rooting for Hamlet, okay? And if he's rooting for Hamlet and Hamlet ends up going down, then it seems as though that makes him, you know, a little you know, off the hook, so to speak, all right? The queen makes fun and says, he's fat and scant of breath. Here, Hamlet, take my napkin, rub thy brows. The queen carouses to thy fortune, Hamlet, and she lifts that cup. That poison cup. She lifts it up. I like. I drink to you, Hamlet. And Hamlet says, "Good, madam." The king, Gertrude, do not drink. All right. The queen says, "I will, my lord. I pray you pardon me. I got this. I'm the queen." And she, whoop, drinks that poison wine. All right. The king, aside to the audience, says, "It is the poison cup. It's too late." They continue their uh, fencing, their sword play, their battle on page 279. Laertes says, have at you. All right. Now, under that, look at um, the stage directions. It says, Laertes wounds Hamlet. Then in, a, in scuffling, they change rapiers and Hamlet wounds Laertes. So, remember, that is the uh, sword that has the poison on it and Hamlet is struck with it. Hamlet is now poisoned. But then they get into this little scuffle. You know, they lose their swords. Hamlet just goes and picks up one. And that one happens to be the one that Laertes had originally. And then he turns and he strikes Laertes. Now, Laertes has been struck with his own poison sword. All right. So what we have is the queen has drunk the poison cup. Hamlet has been struck with the poison sword. And Laertes also has been struck with his own sword poison sword. We got three down right now. All right. The king goes, part them. They are incensed. Like they're, they're actually having at it. So get them apart from one another. Hamlet's like, nay, come again. Let's keep this going. All right. But then the queen falls. Uh-oh. Osric says, look to the queen there. Ho. And Horatio notices something. Notice that they're actually hurt. They're actually uh, bleeding. He says, they bleed on both sides. How is it, my lord? Like, you know, how are you? How did that come to be? These are supposed to be, you know, just uh, foils for fencing, but people are actually scarred, actually damaged from this. Okay? That's not how it's supposed to be. All right? Laertes says, why, as a woodcock to mine own spring, Ostrich, he falls, I am justly killed with my own treachery. All right? So, Laertes goes down. And as he goes down, he calls out, I am justly killed. This is justice. I am justly killed with mine own treachery. All right. Hamlet says, how does the queen? The king says, she swoons to see them bleed. You know, not that she's dying, not that she drank poison, that she's just, oh, the blood is, is, is just too much for me. That's the king's excuse for why the queen has dropped. The queen says, no, no, the drink, the drink. Oh, my dear Hamlet, the drink, the drink. I am poisoned, and she dies. All right? Hamlet says, oh, villainy. Ho, oh, let the door be locked. Treachery, seek it out. All right? And him locking that doors again, locking the doors again is a reminder to me of when, you know, uh, Telemachus and Odysseus, you know, locked the doors and took the suitors on. It's like we're almost right back in that circumstance, okay? 
except for, I guess, the difference is Hamlet has a mortal wound right now. So the top of page 281, Laertes comes, and he's on his way out. You know, he's just said, you know, I, I'm, I've been killed by my own treachery, all right? And so he says, it is here, Hamlet. Hamlet, thou art slain. No medicine in the world can do thee good. In thee there is not half an hour's life. The treacherous instrument is in thy hand. Like you're holding the very thing that killed you. Unbated and envenomed. The foul practice hath turned itself on me. Lo, here I lie, never to rise again. Thy mother's poison I can no more. Like I can't do this anymore. And then he says, the king. The king's to blame. All right. Hamlet says, the point and venom too. Then venom, do thy work. All right. And he, it says, hurts the king. So he takes that same uh, sword that has done him in, you know, that is, you know, doing him in, that is, you know, causing Laertes to be on his last breath, and he takes it against the king. So all three of those men are going down from the same weapon, all right? Hamlet says, Here, thou incestuous, murderous, damned Dane, drink off this poison. Is thy union here? And then he forces the king to drink the poisoned wine. And he says, follow my mother. All right? And then the king dies. All right? Laertes says, he is justly served. It is a poison tempered by himself. Exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet. Mine and my father's death come not upon thee, nor thee on, or thine on me. And then he dies. Ha Hamlet then says, Heaven, make thee free of it. I follow thee. I'm dead, Horatio. Wretched queen, adieu. So Hamlet, on his way out, on page 283, they hear a marching coming on. All right? Austric comes in and says, Young Fortinbras, with conquest come from Poland, to the ambassadors of England gives this warlike volley. All right, Hamlet hears that uh, Fortinbras is the one that's coming. And Hamlet says on 392, but I do prophecy the election lights on Fortinbras. He has my dying voice. So tell him with occurrence more and less, which have uh, solicited, the rest is silence. And he dies. All right, give Fortinbras all that Fortinbras deserves. Hamlet sees himself in Fortinbras. Things were taken from Fortinbras. And Fortinbras is mad. And Fortinbras is doing something to settle the score. And it took all of this, Hamlet's mother dying, Laertes dying, Hamlet himself dying, and the king dying, for Hamlet to come to grips with everything and to see how this is all playing out. And he sees that Fortinbras has a far better, better handle on everything than he ever did. And says, give Fortinbras my blessing, essentially. All right? Um, one of the ambassadors points out to us on page 285, line 411, that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. All right? So, here we have a dead Hamlet, a dead Laertes, a dead queen, a dead king, a dead Rosencrantz, and a dead Guildenstern. Okay? Not to mention, you know, before this, a dead King Hamlet, a dead Polonius, a dead Ophelia. Ugh. All right. Lots of death and destruction. All right? Um, Horatio says, on, uh, beginning on page, uh, line 419, says, give order that these bodies high on a stage be placed to view. And let me speak to the yet unknowing world, how these things came about. So shall you hear of carnal, bloody, and unnatural acts of accidental judgments 
uh, casual slaughters of deaths put on by cunning and forced cause, and in this upshot purposes mistook, fallen on the inventor's heads. All this I can truly deliver. Fortinbras even says, line 431, With sorrow I embrace my fortune. I have some rights of memory in this kingdom, which now to claim my vantage doth invite me. He's getting back that stuff that was, you know, part of, um, you know, the battle with Denmark and uh, Norway when King Hamlet killed King Fortinbras. Now young Fortinbras is going to take back that which was taken from them. And we end with Fortinbras having the final word and having the final word on Hamlet. Page 287. He says, line 441, let four captains bear Hamlet like a soldier to the stage, for he was likely, had he been put on, to have proved most royal. And for his passage, the soldiers' music and the right of war speak loudly for him. Take up the bodies. Such a sight as this becomes the field, but here shows much amiss. Go, bid the soldiers shoot. Saying there that Hamlet had what it took to be royalty. But it was caught up in all of these other things, all this other intrigue, all these other dissenters and people with designs on their own power. And if Hamlet had been able to ascend the throne under any normal circumstances, Fortinbras believes he would have proven himself to be a decent king. That's up for you to decide. All right? Hamlet, where everybody dies. Well, that ends uh, this uh, Shakespearean work. Um, thanks for the time. We will continue on with other works as we uh, keep working our way through them. Until then, and as always, happy reading.